honour tonight to introduce uh, a former colleague, friend, fellow campaigner and activist, uh, Dr. Alex Scott Samuel. Uh, I suppose I've known Alex for about eight or nine years. You came to Liverpool much earlier than that. I did, well, I've, I've come home, I've always been a scouser, but... Uh, no, more... I moved to the department. Oh, uh, no, it wasn't like... 15, 20. Oh, God, don't put those many years on me. Um, <laughs> but Alex has had a distinguished career uh, as a public health consultant, as a public health academic, uh, as an activist. You were a founder member, were you not, to keep our NHS public, Alex? Certainly was. Uh, and he is currently the recently elected chair of the Socialist Health Association, uh, who uh, had the... Did you move the motion at conference this year? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, and Alex did move the uh, motion to the Labour Party conference this year in Brighton uh, to renationalise the NHS. I can think of a few people uh, better qualified to talk about the NHS. I think I first saw you uh, on Panorama many years ago, uh, bemoaning the first PFI plans for the new Royal, saying that this will cost a billion pounds for the health for the local health economy over 30 years uh, for the original one. Uh, and we, although we are bumbled with that great white elephant that is going to cost us. Well, £747 million, pounds. Uh, it, we got a better deal. So we do win sometimes. Um, so Alex is going to talk to us about the immediate uh, history of the NHS, which uh, is 70 years old next week, uh, next year rather, uh, and the prospects for the NHS under a future Labour government. So I will hand over to you, Alex. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you. Uh, don't applaud till you hear what I've got to say. <laughs> it's great to be here, and thanks so much for inviting me, Dave, and, and thank you all very much for coming. So um, uh, I've got the best part of an hour um, to talk about the prospects for Labour policy on a renationalised NHS. And if, if that word is a surprise to anybody, renationalise, I hope it will be clear by the time I've finished why that is very much the agenda at the moment. And as Dave said, was very much the agenda that, uh, that we were talking about in Brighton at, at, at the conference this year. Um, as, as Dave said, uh, I was... Uh, in the public health department at Liverpool. I'm technically retired now, but, um, uh, you know, like Tony Benn, I, I, I left my job in order to spend more time in politics. And um, uh, I, I'm very pleased to have been elected as chair uh, of the Socialist Health Association back in March and as vice chair of Liverpool Wavertree constituency in July and uh, very much looking forward to um, pushing Labour policy more leftward in both of those roles. So I'm going to start off, as every researcher should, by talking about my <coughs> positionality. And if that is unfamiliar to any of you, it just shows what a lot of... Um, uh, uninformed researchers there are around because we all know instinctively that your 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 social and your material background and foreground for that matter are crucial to the kind of research you do and the way you do that research um, and therefore it's crucial to say what your what what social and economic and uh, academic position you're coming from in relation to any evidence that you present. Qualitative researchers are normally strong <coughs> on acknowledging positionality, but quantitative researchers are often weak because they assume quite falsely that um, quantitative research is... Uh, objective and value-free and um, uh, things of that sort, which, of course, we all know it isn't. Research, all research is socially constructed. 
just as in the views of some people, including myself, science is, is socially constructed, but that's a discussion we can have later or, or possibly another time. So, so this is my positionality, basically. Um, the ration book represents the fact that uh, I was born in 1947, so I've spent my whole life in the National Health Service, and obviously that helps <coughs> commit me to uh, defending and promoting it at every opportunity. Um, I'm a feminist and a pacifist, and that very much informs my view of medicine as a medical practitioner, of public health, and of politics. Um, I'm, I'm a public health doctor, so hence the Faculty of Public Health logo, and obviously that is also part of where I'm coming from in terms of what you'll be hearing from me. And um, the, the bottom right one was meant to represent the fact that I'm a socialist, although I am in fact a member of Liverpool Socialist Singers, uh, a tenor, uh, if you were wondering. Um, and uh, as you may have heard before, I was going to start by inviting you all to join me in a rendering of something appropriate, but uh, thought better of it. Um, this is another part of my positionality. I, I don't have any problem at all with the idea that researchers can be members of political parties. So when this particularly stupid headline appeared in the Telegraph a few years ago, um, after I'd co-authored a report on the impact of Thatcherism on health and well-being in, in Britain, um, uh, I, I just thought, well, you know, that's the kind of thing you expect. A bit like some of you will have seen today, there is a, a report out saying that uh, several hundred thousand people have died prematurely as a result of austerity since uh, 2010. And no doubt the same will be said in some of the right-wing papers, i.e. the fact that some of those people may have political allegiances uh, um, you know, according to the right-wing press, somehow casts doubt on the, the quality of their research. In other words, pure nonsense. That's, that is the Thatcher paper, if anyone's interested. Uh, these slides, I think, will go up on the website, so you'll catch the references. It was in the International Journal of Health Services. And uh, as you, can, you might imagine, particularly those of you who lived through that period, there were really substantial impacts of Thatcherism on health and well-being in Britain, just about all of them negative. Uh, there's another picture of Thatcher, um, a slightly more accurate one in my view than the photograph. And um, you may recall, some of you may recall, that she claimed that the NHS was safe in her hands. And I think the picture actually gives a... a a more effective um, picture of uh, whether or not it was. And in fact, exactly the same. It could now be Theresa May or Jeremy Hunt or Simon Stevens uh, wielding that axe. And I will say more about those personages um, in the next few minutes. Um, OK. Uh, yeah, in fact, um, let's start with Thatcher. Um, Although people thought that Thatcher didn't get the opportunity to do much to the NHS, uh, this headline followed the revelation in 2012 under the 30-year rule of um, cabinet papers uh, showing that the central policy review staff, the cabinet office as it is now, were commissioned by Thatcher specifically to uh, put forward ideas about how the NHS could be fully privatised and turned into an insurance-based service. This was as early as 1982, and it was only a near riot in her right-wing cabinet that pre prevented these plans seeing the light of day. But they're in the Thatcher Foundation website, and um, um, it, it's interesting to know that. What she did do in 82 was privatise the so-called ancillary services in hospitals, the cleaning, laundry, portering and catering. And of course, the cleaner is the person you talk to the most when you're a patient in hospital. So it was a double tragedy. Firstly, because they were all put on horrendous uh, contracts 
uh, cleaners no longer were able to talk to patients and act as part of the caring team. And perhaps more, Im no, equally importantly, we had a, a gradual lead in to the horrendous epidemics of hospital acquired infection that we have today. And MRSA has quite explicitly been traced back in, in research papers to Thatcher's privatisation of hospital cleaning in 82. Later in the Thatcher period, um, uh, as you know, the utilities were privatised. Just about everything that moved was privatised. And Oliver Letwin uh, was one of the key people involved in that. And he published this obscenely titled book in 1987, Privatising the World, um, in which a whole chapter talked about how to persuade a reluctant electorate um, to accept the privatisation of a, a popular service. And Andrew Lansley followed that chapter to the letter when he introduced the Health and Social Care Act in 2012. Um, Letwin wasn't the only uh, person doing this kind of work. Uh, John Redwood, David Willits were also involved. Um, and um, this bunch, the Adam Smith Institute, this is still available online, um, The Health Alternatives by Madsen Perry and, um, uh, sorry, Eamon Butler, um, which basically sets out, in effect, the Health and Social Care Act. The structures set out in this 1988 pamphlet are identical to the structures we have now, except that the CCGs are called a different name, etc. But it's all about preparing the NHS for insurance funding and privatisation. This is all context, of course, for what I'm going to be saying about Labour and renationalisation. And I had the pleasure, if that's the right word, a couple of weeks ago of debating with the same Madsen Perry um, at Durham Union uh, the motion that Margaret Thatcher was the greatest post-war Prime Minister. Um, he, the person leading uh, Piri's team was um, uh, Sir Edward Lee, um, who is still an MP um, and who was Thatcher's, um, uh, I think, parliamentary private secretary at one time. We lost narrowly... Uh, 126 to 110. I was with the uh, Alan Cummings of the Durham Miners, um, and um, uh, as Sir Edward Lee said at breakfast the following morning, um, the Durham Union is the only place where you could have lost uh, um, that debate. Uh, they charge students 60 quid to join and uh, has a bit of a reputation. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, 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 um, unfortunately, of course, the privatisation that began in the Thatcher period carried on uh, under Tony Blair. And this uh, article from 2002, I think, it, no, no, from 2000, was when Alan Milburn um, signed the so-called Concordat with the private sector, which ushered in the beginnings of the privatisation, which... Um, uh, as Dave said, led to us setting up Keep Our NHS Public in 2004-2005 under, uh, as Kinnock would have said, a Labour government. You know, what the hell were Labour doing privatising the NHS? Well, you'll have to ask Tony Blair that and Alan Milburn and Patricia Hewitt. And, um, oh, here a year later um, was Oliver Letwin again, who could see the way that uh, things were going. No, sorry, I think this is 2004. Um, and uh, he, w he was uh, recorded in a private meeting saying how the NHS would not survive uh, the election of the next Conservative government, and indeed it, it hasn't. Uh, um, it, it, it's well on its way already. And Letwin knew ten years ago exactly... What was, what was going to be happening. Um, and here is my former friend and colleague, my friend and former colleague, Debbie Abrahams, now the Shadow uh, Secretary for Work and Pensions, but who worked with me and with Dave at the time um, at Liverpool University's Department of Public Health. Debbie worked with me for 10 years and um, 
Uh, she was also at the same time chair of Rochdale Primary Care Trust and resigned in 2006 when one of Milburn's successors, Patricia Hewitt, was, was privatising uh, um, the NHS in a particularly excessive way, as it were, and the independent sector treatment centres were, 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 were being established and large amounts of taxpayers' money was, was being given to the private sector. And Debbie, to her credit, uh, was not prepared to, um, to stomach that. We also uh, could see what was happening um, for in this quotation from Mark Britnell in 2010. Uh, Britnell was at that time uh, in the uh, Department of Health, Director of Commissioning in the Department of Health, although he's now the Head of Health at KPMG. And in a private uh, uh, health corporations uh, meeting in New York, um, he, he basically said uh, what you can see in front of you. In future, the NHS will be a state insurance provider, not a state deliverer. Um, and use this repulsive phrase in the middle there, the NHS will be shown no mercy. This is what people in the Department of Health, uh, unfortunately under Labour, but particularly under the Conservatives, were like in terms of the way they saw the NHS and what was destined uh, for it. So uh, most of you will know about the 2012 Health and Social Care Act and many of you like me will have done your best to resist its, um, its development. And in summary, this is, these are some of the impacts it had. It's a massive 450-page document, massive for, for, for a parliamentary act. And the reason it's so big is because it was written by McKinsey's corporate lawyers. It was written in such a way to make absolutely sure that every element of the NHS could in the future be privatised. And we haven't got there yet, uh, as um, the government and Simon Stevens would you know, say to you, the NHS is still free at the point of use, uh, it, it, you know, where you can get it. Um, uh, but, but this is basically what the Act does. Um, we, we lost the Secretary of State's duty of provision of a comprehensive service. We lost the necessity to provide a universal service in every part of the, the land. We lost the necessity to provide a comprehensive, a full range of health services in every locality. We lost the necessity to provide free services, although many services, of course, remain free, because the Tories are doing this covertly. They're imposing this uh, privatisation. Um, we lost integration, and don't believe what you're told by the government about integration. I'm a diabetic with a lot of complications. I'm, um, well, I'm registered blind. Uh, I have neuropathy and various other bits and pieces. I see five different specialists. And since, um, since the Health and Social Care Act, there, you know, I had what was a more or less seamless service, and now it's absolutely all over the place because, of course, they don't share data. And um, those who, um, where I'm unfortunate enough to have to use private services, um, there's no way that they link with the public services. So don't believe what you hear about uh, integration. And of course, up to 49% of services can be, uh, can be private. And so like there's a big new hospital, being NHS so-called hospital, being built in Birmingham with 45% um, private beds. And this is in effect the impact of the health and and uh, Social Care Act. Um, the, the NHS is, is just a logo for a semi-privatised um, healthcare uh, contracting operation. And when you go into your health centre or hospital and you see NHS above the door, it can just as well be Richard Branson behind that door or Specsavers or somebody than uh, a public NHS uh, service. Um, 
this is, these are the three elements of what is going on at the moment. Uh, it's very confusing when we see different headlines every day about the disasters affecting the NHS. But in essence, it's these three elements, privatisation, cuts and rationing. Um, and at different times, different ones are stressed. Uh, and I will say more about each of these um, uh, as I go on. I call it a cultural revolution because you'll, some of you will uh, recall or have read about uh, Mao Zedong's uh, cultural revolution in China when all the, um, the sort of, uh, what shall I say, the professional and scientific and other technical uh, and craft workers were put out of work and sent off to the fields, as it were, and uh, everything um, was sort of turned upside down. Um, but, and in the same way, there is a deliberate cultural revolution going on to cause confusion out of which it will seem inevitable that charges and insurance funding will be a necessity. And many of you will have become aware the way in which that is happening, not least from all the health insurance spam you get in your inbox every morning, if you're like me. Um, so I call this intentional NHS chaos. And I also say that the market which was set up by the Health and Social Care Act, the open commercial market, was, an in was intended to fail, um, even though it was a disaster, and that seems a terrible thing, and it seems to show that NHS markets can't work. I think that market was intended to fail because, once again, that shows that there is a need for a different solution, and that is what Simon Stevens Hunt as well, but Simon Stevens in particular, is busy imposing at the moment. Um, obviously, as a result of that market failure, um, there is increasingly, because of the rationing that's going on, and when I say rationing, it takes many forms. Some of you will know there are consultations going on where a handful of people uh, fill in very complicated forms, which is why there often is only a handful doing it. And from the, the small amount of evidence that that produces, skewed evidence, I should say, um, the CCGs conclude that uh, people are saying that access to things like cataract operations and joint replacement operations doesn't need to be... Uh, uh, as accessible as, as they have been in the past. And the bar is steadily being raised, which of course drives people who can't bear the pain to the private sector, um, or, or the waiting lists drive people to the private sector. So uh, um, increasingly, as I say, there are also charges and co-payments for different aspects of care. Uh, personal health budgets, we don't hear much about that at this moment. A year or two ago, Simon Stevens was pushing that heavily, and he will again in the future, mark my words, because it was one of the things that he brought uh, from America. Um, uh, and I, I'll mention more about that in a minute. Um, but personal health budgets is one of the things that helps create uh, a, a system like the accountable care organisations currently being set up um, which is already to be taken over by health insurance. Personal budgets replacing national pooled budgets is one of the routes to that. Um, and health insurance and privatisation, as I say, is the ultimate aim. Um, so um, th this is what's been happening since the Health and Social Care Act. Uh, we started seeing headlines a few years ago um, saying that large numbers of hospitals could go bust. And now, of course, it's happening on a large scale. And there have been a lot of articles uh, recently uh, in the press about the numbers of hospitals. It starts with the A&E departments. They claim that uh, uh, 
we have more A&E departments than we need or that they can't be properly staffed or whatever. Next thing, they're being shut down and replaced by downgraded urgent care centres, etc. And even some of those are now being shut down. And ultimately, well, I'll say more when I talk about the, um, the STPs. But this is one of the ways that the Tories have made this happen, through the imposition of deficits. And the reason I say imposition, there's nothing that suddenly caused hospitals to suddenly start going into deficit. Deficits are socially and economically constructed by the Treasury in conjunction with the Department of Health. And this map from a Health Foundation publication shows how between 2012 at the top uh, and 2015 at the bottom, that's three successive years, uh, we went from no regions of England being in deficit to almost every region of England being in deficit. So this was a complete construction of the government. As we know, austerity is a political choice and uh, forcing the NHS into deficit was very much part of that agenda. This is the um, Health Foundation uh, publication that that uh, map comes from, A Perfect Storm. Um, I mentioned Simon Stevens, and um, that's not a picture of him. Um, that's an article I had in the BMJ blog uh, commentary column a few years ago, basically labelling Stevens as a cheerleader in chief for NHS privatisation. Uh, it's very tempting to point the finger solely at the Tory party, well, or at Tories of all parties, if you like, um, in terms of... Uh, the politics of privatisation. But Simon Stevens, once Tony Blair's number 10 health advisor in the early years of this century, um, and the person who introduced things like the independent sector treatment centres, which I mentioned earlier, which hemorrhaged money to the private sector. Um, people, you know, the NHS was forced to send patients to these independent sector treatment centres quite unnecessarily in order to force the private sector into the NHS, which was part of Blair's intention. And Stevens was the agent of that. He was then snapped up by United Health in uh, 2004. United Health, a predatory, NHS, uh, a predatory health corporation in Minneapolis, and ended up as their executive vice president. Um, until he was uh, headhunted by the Conservative Party in 2014 and made chief exec of NHS England. Um, uh, because he's fighting for more resources for the NHS at the moment, it's tempting to see him as a good guy. Um, but take my word for it, a lot of those resources that he's fighting for will be to increase the development of the so-called STPs and ACOs that I'm going to talk to you about and increase the, the, the momentum, uh, and I'm using that word with a very small m, towards privatisation. So, um, uh, so that, that's, that's what Simon Stevens is about. Um, the, gov the Tories then started attacking the health professions and this uh, relates to the... Um, attack uh, on the junior doctor's contract, which you'll recall a couple of years ago. And um, uh, although it was presented in terms of issues like weekend working and all that, and the government was shown to be completely false in, in their notion that um, uh, either the doctors weren't working at weekends or that uh, a full seven-day week uh, could provide a more effective NHS um, they used that as part of the basis of their attack on junior doctors and on their terms and conditions and their training in particular. But this wasn't out of the blue. And in fact, it goes back actually to the pre-Thatcher days. Because in my research on Thatcher, it's taken me back, for example, to this paper, the Nationalised Industries Policy Group, which you'll find on the Thatcher Foundation. And this report from a group chaired by Nicholas Ridley in 1977 talks about how they will attack the, uh, the staff of public services as and when they become government, which, of course, they did in 79. 
And as they say here, and this was very much uh, echoed in the treatment of junior doctors, it's not wage comparability that uh, conditions of service should be judged on. You know, comparability with, say, doctors in other sectors or in other countries. It's public vulnerability. So those two criteria, as you can see there, um, the shortage or surplus of manpower, in other words, is there a shortage of doctors and the vulnerability of the nation to a strike is what those cynical neoliberal um, uh, conservatives were saying before Thatcher was elected. That is part of the theoretical basis of what Thatcherism was all about, attacking and undermining the public sector in terms of perceived public vulnerability to a strike. Okay, so what's been happening since the Health and Social Care Act? Well, first there was what I call phase one, the open commercial market, which opened the NHS up to um, the European uh, commercial competition, which followed that act. Um, and then after that failed, whether or not it was intentional is perhaps debatable. Um, I say it was, but there were also a lot of disasters that definitely were not even Tory intentions, like avoidable deaths, for example. Because the way the private sector makes its profits in the NHS uh, is by um, understaffing and de-skilling in order to make the services cheaper. And of course that means poorer quality services. And any of you who use any of the services in this city that were privatised, like Prince's Park Health Centre, which I was once a patient of, um, we'll, we'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and there, there were avoidable deaths around the country and uh, people whose um, poor quality eye operations failed and led them to go back to NHS um, uh, emergency services to, 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 to have them repaired and corrected. So what um, Stevens introduced after he came in, back in 2014 from America is what I call the planned privatisation phase, which is going on at the moment. A lot of people have been fooled into thinking it's good news because it involves regional structures which had been taken away by Lansley. But those regional structures are not like the regional health authorities we once had. Um, they're like regional corporations and I'll be saying more about that. So what Stevens brought in first was the five-year forward view um, with its so-called new models of care, um, which were about basically undermining NHS hospitals and replacing them by sort of packages of care in community units with less skilled staff uh, than in specialist uh, hospital units. There were vanguards, which um, were so-called pilot projects, although none of them were properly evaluated in the way pilots are supposed to be. Um, and there was NHS devolution, most obviously in Manchester, where, uh, sadly, the whole uh, of the health services in Greater Manchester um, uh, were, were handed over um, by Osborne, together with Hunt, um, to the... Um, enthusiastic, I'm sad to say, uh, Labour councils in Greater Manchester who thought because they were going to get their hands on the money that would actually give them some control, which of course in the context of austerity and everything that's happening to local government and so on is a complete nonsense. Then there were the, sustain the STPs, the Sustainability and Transformation Plans and the ACOs, Accountable Care Organisations, um, uh, both of those uh, are going on at the moment and I will say more about them. This is the five-year forward view which introduced um, those, uh, those STPs, ACOs and so-called uh, new models of care. Um, and these are the elements of the five-year forward view. As I've said, replacing hospital beds with care at home, uh, digital monitoring, home visits, etc., replacing full A&E services with urgent care centres, 
replacing expensive specialist care, unavoidably expensive specialist care, with community care packages provided by less qualified staff, as, as I've said. Um, and um, of course, all of these uh, approaches are attractive to, um, to corporates and to insurance. And that, of course, is what we are being prepared for. Um, although, of course, um, government have been so clever in the covert way they've done this, both Hunt and Lansley, um, that, that they've so far managed to get away with it. Um, this uh, brilliant uh, uh, blog by Stuart Player, who some of you will know from his, um, his uh, book that he co-authored with Colin Lee's The Plot Against the NHS. This is on the Socialist Health Association website. And what Stuart's research in the Scottish Library over a long period uh, discovered was that the STPs were not, as Simon Stevens and NHS England claim, uh, dreamt up in, uh, in London uh, at NHS England in conjunction with doctors and nurses with whom they discussed these issues around the country and health managers, etc. They were actually dreamt up in the World Economic Forum at Davos and Stuart cites in this paper, um, uh, and it's still up there on the SHA website, the two reports from Davos which precisely, which contain precisely everything in the five-year forward view. The new models of care, the, um, uh, the, the, the way in which they would be uh, put into practice, not just in the UK, but this was aimed to undermine public, publicly funded health services around the world. Because that, of course, is what the multi, the transnational corporates who meet at Davos are all about. It's about giving them greater power and greater profit. And Simon Stevens, of course, in 2012, was at United Health, and he led the group at Davos, which produced uh, and implemented the two reports here. And I'm very sorry to say some uh, UK uh, MPs were, were also involved in that. <coughs> but basically, this is why the Tories brought Stevens back from Minneapolis to the UK to, to impose this, uh, these transnational uh, capitalist plans on the NHS, which is what is happening at the moment. Um, this is an article from the BMJ um, about the evaluation of Devo Mank, the, the Manchester devolution, which I've mentioned, and it raises a number of interesting issues particularly about the loss of national uh, standards of care, uh, sorry, terms and conditions and quality standards, which of course is what devolution is all about. Don't believe all this rubbish about the northern powerhouse. Um, devolution um, is, is certainly in the health context, uh, is very much about fragmenting the NHS from a national service um, to to a local non-service, and I'll, I'll be saying more about that. It was discussed whether or not Liverpool would go in that direction, and I don't think Steve Rotherham has yet expressed any uh, interest in taking over uh, health in the, um, the greater, uh, in the Liverpool city region area, but um, who knows uh, what, what may still be to come. The problems with devolution, as I've said, are about, uh, well, about localising the government's budget shortfalls so that the blame, of course, falls on the local authorities, the short-sighted local authorities, rather than on government. Um, the loss of national standards, uh, the postcode lotteries that we're seeing around us at the moment in terms of rationing of treatments, um, the loss of a, a, a national universalist service with pooling of risk around the country from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. Uh, 
and the STPs are very much doing that at the moment. Um, the, uh, there is no evidence whatever for this kind of uh, devolution in healthcare, and of course there's absolutely no democratic debate. This was a conference we had uh, a, a couple of years ago um, at the Adelphi, um, and uh, it just uh, is quite a, an appropriate uh, illustration, I think, to, uh, to, to show what, what, where devolution is taking us. So the current form of all this, as I say, is, is the STPs. And um, the initial plans for STPs um, are, are, are summarised here, that there will be fixed budgets for every area of the country with an STP, and there are 44 of those areas at the moment. So no longer is there national pooling of finance so that the needier areas get more. Absolutely rigidly fixed budgets, um, and the same in terms of care. Um, fixed, uh, fixed levels of care being provided through these so-called new models of care. Surplus, so-called surplus NHS land is being sold off under the so-called Naylor report. And of course it's not surplus at all. At present the NHS sites being sold off include 117 sites where there is clinical activity. So they're, they're not surplus at all. It's about raising money to, to fund these dreadful um, uh, STPs. Um, and the seven-day NHS was part of the original uh, plans for the STPs. And there were financial penalties for areas that didn't follow them. So, so much for all the nonsense about CCGs being led by GPs, etc. They were very much dictated by the government. And as the Health Service Journal said at the time, private providers were looking at uh, a role within these STPs because that is very much the government's intention. So don't believe what you hear about, uh, about them being part of a, a public service. So, um, what are the STPs? Uh, what are the characteristics of them? They were imposed without with neither parliamentary nor a public mandate. Stevens is very clever, and he's done all this through regulation. He's undertaken the biggest reorganisation the NHS has had since 1948, with no public consultation whatever, and not even a parliamentary debate. And we, as in the population of this country, and in particular the 650 population of the House of Commons, ha have let him get away with it. There is an explicit uh, aim to eliminate deficits, so-called, in each STP area by cutting services. So, in other words, um, the services are being rationed and in some areas they've already specified which services will be provided. And uh, 25 billion cuts um, are being made nationally at the moment through the STPs with about a billion of those here in the Cheshire and Merseyside STP. The replacement of specialist hospital care, as I've said, with cheaper, untested, de-skilled new models of care. Um, that, that is the, the key element uh, of the um, STPs. And um, the way that these STP plans, sustainability and transformation plans, are, are being implemented now is through so-called accountable care organisations. You'll also hear the phrase accountable care systems. Um, the systems is, if you like, the alliances of local authorities, those who are short-sighted enough to go along with them. Uh, and the organisations are the actual bodies delivering them. And some are more ahead than others in terms of developing these ACOs which are based on health maintenance organisations in the US. 
and um, many of you, particularly those who have seen the Michael Moore film Sicko, will know what a disaster those have been. I better hurry up. Um, okay, accountable care organisations. Um, they don't have to be universal, they don't have to be comprehensive, um, uh, and um, uh, they will deliver, as I've said, contracts for defined, restricted packages of care. And there has recently been a, a so-called consultation, which people only learnt about when it was leaked, um, about the uh, ACO contract. Um, rigidly fixed budgets, as I've said, very much designed for insurance top-ups and eventual privatisation. Um, at the time of the last general election, uh, Labour started saying that they would halt the Tories' um, uh, STPs, but they didn't say it as strongly as they could. So let's move on to the manifesto. The manifesto was really the stimulus for this, um, uh, th this lecture. So um, I'm going to give you a few quotes from the health and care section of the manifesto. There were a lot of good things in it, but there was, uh, many people said that, that the health section was the weakest section of the manifesto. And um, uh, perhaps this will illustrate why. So um, th this is one quote from it. Uh, it mixes the, the good and the dubious. Um, Labour will halt and review the NHS STPs. Um, so yes, that, that sounds positive. Halt and review. Although, of course, a review doesn't necessarily imply how and whether it will actually be eliminated. We will create a new quality, safety and excellence regulator. Yep, so that, that sounds very good. Um, the next Labour government will reverse privatisation. That sounds great, doesn't it? And of course we were delighted to see that. And return our health services into expert public control. I'm not sure what expert and inexpert public control are by comparison, but it can't be bad, can it? Expert public control. Labour will repeal the Health and Social Care Act. Uh, yes, that, that, that is also very positive. We will reinstate the powers of the Secretary of State for Health once again, something that is very much uh, required. We will introduce a new legal duty on the Secretary of State and on NHS England to ensure that excess private profits are not made out of the NHS at the expense of patient care. Hang on a minute. If we're going to completely reverse NHS privatisation, surely there wouldn't be any private profits. And um, I think I forgot to mention something in the previous, um, where is, it? oh yes, yes, on the previous slide you'll recall uh, one of the things that I forgot to mention, the NHS will be the preferred provider. Once again, hang on, if there is a fully public NHS, then there, there is no choice of providers. There's no such thing as a preferred provider. That implies, at the very minimum, an internal market. So you can see that the health section of the, um, the manifesto was a bit of a, a crazy mixed up kid. And one of the things that happened at Brighton this year, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, this is uh, um, John Ashworth, the um, Shadow Secretary for Health, speaking at a rally just before the, um, the Brighton conference started. Uh, this rally was on um, September the 24th. And he said, uh, he went, having been slightly criticised by some for saying, halt and review the STPs, he actually said for the first time at this rally, and I was there so uh, I can be a witness, we will halt the STPs. Um, and it was very good to hear that. Um, 
So what happened in the actual conference itself? Well, this very interesting blog in Labour Briefing recently by Faye Dalka gives an insider's view of what went on at the, um, the compositing meeting when the motion to be debated on the NHS was, was put together. Um, and what this essentially says was that the, the front table, as it were, uh, which included Lord Philip Hunt, uh, the Labour health spokesman in the Lords, um, had put forward a draft uh, NHS composite motion for debate at conference, which failed to mention the five-year forward view, as had originally been proposed in the 40 uh, constituency motions that had gone into the composite, and failed to mention um, the NHS reinstatement bill, which had also been in all of those 40. And basically, as this blog makes clear, and once again, I can be a witness, I was in that uh, compositing meeting, people got so angry with what the uh, shadow team were proposing that they became very uh, assertive and insisted that the full content of all the proposed motions be included. And that was why we did eventually get a very radical motion, which uh, is on the Keep Our NHS public website. You can see the motion in full, which essentially called for full renationalisation of the NHS. And as Dave said, I was elected to propose that motion and Sue Richards of Keep Our NHS Public to second it. And I was very proud to fulfil that role to propose the complete renationalisation of the NHS and even prouder when the motion was carried unanimously. Having said that, um, proposing a motion is not, uh, is not the end and carrying a motion is not the end of the story. You then need action and we can't wait for the next general election to renationalise the NHS. God knows what will have happened to the, uh, depending on when the election occurs, to the NHS by then, although we all fervently hope it will be sooner rather than later. So I published this, um, uh, this article um, in the Morning Star, basically saying Labour needs to get its act together now and we need particularly Labour councils, but all Labour politicians need to act now to w withdraw cooperation from the dreadful STPs and ACOs and prevent them going ahead here and now. We need a bit of non-violent direct action. Um, John Ashworth, once again, has been very positive in his rhetoric and at last week's, uh, sorry, two weeks ago at the Health Campaigns Together conference on um, November the 4th, um, uh, came out with this very positive notion uh, of how um, STPs were, were going to be halted and uh, we were going to fight for the NHS. Um, but once again, um, we still need uh, Labour to really come to terms and start talking actively to all Labour councils. At the moment, we only have two Labour councils that are fully refusing to collaborate with STPs. Hammersmith and Fulham Council and Ealing Council. And we need every council every Labour council in the country and every council which has people who care about the NHS actively refusing to collaborate in every possible way with the way that the NHS is steamrolling through these STPs. And this is a blog I published a couple of days ago in Labour briefing. Um, uh, asking this question which still has to be asked can we renationalize the nhs because we a lot more needs to be done than is presently being done one of the things that needs to be done i've mentioned already we need an nhs reinstatement bill and the, the fantastic mp for wirral west margaret greenwood took 
the NHS Bill 2016-17, as drafted by Professor Alison Pollock and Peter Roderick, among others, um, to its second reading in the previous Parliament. It's still there on the Parliament website if you want to look at it. Um, and there is also a website um, which, which tells you all about uh, the um, NHS reinstatement bill. Um, but we need an NHS reinstatement bill here now, coming from Labour, as a rallying cry to people to say Labour are going to reinstate the NHS and we're starting here and now. But as yet, I'm afraid we've heard nothing about that and we need to hear something very soon. Um, this shows that uh, it's not just Margaret Greenwood but also Jeremy Corbyn who supports the, uh, the NHS reinstatement bill. And we need the Labour leadership and the Labour front bench to be actively saying that now if we're going to push forward the renationalisation agenda. This is the NHS Take Back Pledge from the organisation called We Own It. Um, and once again, this is on the, um, uh, on the internet. 73 uh, um, MPs have signed it, um, about uh, half of whom are Labour MPs. But we need a lot more Labour MPs than, than the 36 or so that have signed it. Most of the others are, are SNP, who, as you know, have been strong supporters of NHS reinstatement, even in, even in England, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say. Um, so um, uh, we need, once again, we need to have the Labour leadership and the Labour uh, shadow health team signing up to things like this NHS Take Back Pledge, which has nothing in it that wasn't in the motion that I took to the Labour Party conference. In the last couple of weeks, some of you will know um, that we've had two proposed judicial reviews. Three, I should say, actually. The first was from the group called 999 Call for the NHS and is challenging the legality of the... Um, STP in South Yorkshire because it fails to provide a comprehensive uh, uh, full range of services and um, uh, it involves rationing and poor, poor quality and safety of care. So that's what that judicial review is about. The second comes from um, Alison Pollock, Peter Roderick and colleagues. Um, and is challenging the failure of Jeremy Hunt to go out to public consultation. And there is a third review on the way, at the, a third judicial review in uh, Oxfordshire happening at the moment because of the closure of services at Horton General Hospital in Banbury. So these judicial reviews are very welcome challenges showing the, the terrible things that the government is doing to the NHS. So what do we still await from the Labour Party if we are really to, re, to have to move to, rapidly towards a renationalised NHS? We want support from the leader's office. So Jeremy, John, we want you speaking out, please, on the need for a renationalised NHS. They're great on talking about funding, but they don't say enough, despite the picture I showed you just before. They're not saying enough at the moment about Labour councils challenging STPs, for example, and Labour MPs doing the same. We want an NHS reinstatement bill, as I've said. Uh, as we want to encourage Labour council leaders to follow the examples of those two councils that I've mentioned. Um, we need national campaign materials. As a, a Labour activist, I go out on the streets campaigning and leafleting and so on, but there haven't been any new campaign materials based on the new NHS policy agreed in Brighton, and I sincerely want some leaflets to that effect. And we want motions of support from constituencies 
and several Liverpool and uh, other constituencies around the country as we speak are putting forward motions saying that their local authorities um, must uh, re refuse to collaborate with STPs. And uh, I proposed such a motion in Wavertree a couple of weeks ago, which was passed unanimously. And of course, most of all, we want a general election. Um, there is, that's the thing that most of all will, will help us uh, bring about a renationalised NHS. There is a website that has just opened, which has a template motion in it. So if you are in the Labour Party, please look at that website and propose such a motion to your constituency. And finally, what will help us develop the renationalised NHS we all so fervently desire? Um, it's a question that we're all asking, and these are just some of the people who, whose actions will help determine it. Most of all, us on the bottom right there. Um, we need to be out there on the streets doing everything we can to push not just Labour but the Conservatives and every other politician going um, and every trade union and professional organisation uh, to, to fight for a fully renationalised NHS in England. At the top right there, um, uh, Jeremy and John are doing their bit, and as you've heard me hinting, perhaps they could be doing a, a little bit more. So um, uh, I hope they're listening, or they will at least listen when this goes up on uh, uh, the, um, the, the internet. And on the left, uh, on the left of the picture, but not by any means on the left of the action, Simon <laughs> Stevens. Uh, the former Labour politician in the 90s. He was a, a Labour councillor in Brixton before he sadly uh, moved across to the dark side where he uh, remains. Um, uh, he's someone whose actions will very much determine what happens. And he's currently distancing himself from May and uh, hunt by arguing vocally for more money for the NHS. But as it stands, it's, some of that money will help uh, austerity-staffed clinical services, but much of it will just help fund the privatisation that Stevens has brought to the NHS and which is well underway. Uh, May, as we know, is on the way out, so hopefully she will just do the sensible thing and um, call a general election and hunt. It's, it's difficult uh, to know what to say about Jeremy Hunt. He has done so many dreadful things to the NHS. So um, perhaps I'll leave it to you to say in the discussion, which I hope will follow, um, uh, what should be done with him. So that's all I want to say. And I hope very much that you've got some uh, comments and questions uh, so we can take this agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, as somebody who's born under the NHS, uh, who's had their life saved by the NHS, uh, who has always thought that the NHS would be there for us, uh, I hope that's both scared you and inspired you a little bit to do something about it because uh, the NHS has always been there to care for me and I will always be there to fight for the NHS. Are there any questions for Alex so as I pass the mic round? Or comments? Or comments. Alex, can you throw any light on the situation in Liverpool specifically? Because uh, Mayor Joe Anderson claims that um, uh, he is rejecting completely STPs in Liverpool, and yet that that's rather confusing because it doesn't actually appear to be the case. Can you throw any light on yes, that? Yes, thanks, Nina. Um, yes, uh, last November at the Health and Wellbeing Board, Joe Anderson, as you've said said 
very vocally and publicly that Liverpool rejects the Cheshire and Merseyside STP. But since then, precisely nothing has been done by the council to act on that rejection. And that's why I, for example, moved the motion that I mentioned earlier at uh, waiver tree and I hope that other Liverpool CLPs will be doing the same and I know that one or two are currently uh, processing motions through their CLPs. Um, what has happened in fact since last November is that well firstly all of the STP the, 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 the NHS took no notice at all of Liverpool or any other council and signed off the contracts for STPs in December. And Liverpool, I'm very sorry to say, has since then collaborated with uh, the STP, um, both in, for example, uh, setting up a joint organisation um, which was to take over uh, Liverpool Community Health um, uh, and uh, Mersey Care was also part of that uh, process. Um, that was about uh, six months ago, I think. But more importantly, since then, um, they've set up something called the Liverpool Integrated Care Partnership Group, LICPUG, um, um, or, or perhaps LICPIG, I don't know, um, uh, which, um, which is an ACO in anything other than name. Um, I in other words, the City Council is currently setting up uh, this integrated partnership group which is an accountable care system in every way identical to those being set up around the country except that it has a different name. And uh, Mayor Joe Anderson is the chair of that group and I'm really sad that this is happening and I'm doing my best to raise awareness around Liverpool uh, and Merseyside so that people can actively oppose this. Um, so that's what's going on in Liverpool. Thank you. Could you put your hand up earlier? I should have just projected that we shall quite well. No, it's Hi, not Hi, Teresa. Hello. Thanks for the presentation. I've seen quite a lot of the presentations you've done. Um, the one thing that does concern me, oh by the way, Joe Anderson talks like a Tory and ticks, ticks boxes like he's Labour, don't buy into it. The one thing that does concern me is Richard Branson and he's steadily inhaling NHS contracts without any challenge and when he doesn't require, acquire a contract he's actually suing now and I'm just concerned that Keep our NHS public national is not starting a campaign against him. That's my one concern, and I've mentioned this before at our local meetings, because people need to know what he's doing. There was a documentary on about five years ago, maybe longer, where he'd taken over a swathe of surgeries, predominantly on the Wirral, but not exclusively, run them into the ground. There was no continuity of care. The chronically ill were suffering. Some of the surgeries were open two days a week. It was all locums who showed up or chose not to show up. And it was an absolute disaster. So he did save money for the NHS because there was no service. It concerns me now that he's, he's got billions of pounds worth of NHS contracts. And we're going to be beholden to him soon. And I just wondered why KOMP National has not done that. You know, challenged him. Yeah. Um, as you know, I'm not a spokesperson for KONP National, although I am on the National <coughs> Steering Group. What I would say is they have done a fair bit of awareness raising about the actions of Virgin Care and of all the other private companies that have been given NHS contracts. Um, I don't know how realistic it is for them specifically to focus on Branson and his services. As you say, Panorama did a very good expose, I think it was a couple of years ago, particularly showing the um, 
uh, primary care practices on the Wirral and other parts of the country that have been taken over by Virgin Care and often been an absolute disaster. And certainly I know that the officers of uh, Wirral CCG who were in the pay of Virgin uh, had to resign uh, as part of the, um, uh, the, the scandals that hit Wirral um, uh, a, a year or so ago at the CCG there. So I think maybe, as you say, more could be done uh, in relation to, to Branson in particular. And I know that a lot has gone on in different parts of the country. And maybe we in Merseyside need to do more than we're doing. But uh, perhaps, as you say, Comp nationally should be doing more. But to me, Branson, uh, while very much a guilty party, the, the others, whether it's Circle Health or Assura or Care UK or any of these other dreadful people, uh, dreadful organisations to whom taxpayers' money is hemorrhaging um, from the NHS, um, uh, need to be focused on equally. But thanks for the point. Alex, can I, can I ask a question? Um, Sorry, where are you? I'm here, in front of all. <laughs> um, so my, I suppose it is that um, I have standpoint is that the market should get out of healthcare and, uh, and, and, and social care. That's, that, that's a given. Uh, that we need to, um, that, that would include, you know, uh, opticians, dental treatment, all of those things. So, so that for me would be the starting point. Um, but is there not a slight problem with the, the use of the word renationalisation because it gives an overarching impression that what we want to do is almost go back to the 50s or the 60s and the health system that was in place in the 50s and 60s. Um, and there's a huge development around medical uh, informatics and how you can deliver healthcare. So, I mean, rather than saying renationalisation, which seems to be, which can give the impression that what we're doing is we want to go back to the 50s and 60s that we want to say, actually, what we want is more and better. We want more, we want the market out, but we want a better, healthier system. And that's one that wasn't to service users, because actually in the 50s and 60s, service users were never listened to. Uh, there was huge power for the consultants. There was, so it's more and better. And the problem with renationalisation as a slogan can give the impression that we just want to go back to the large general hospitals of the 50s. With respect, uh, it's the word impression that I think is the key to what you're saying. If, pe if we say to people, renationalise rail, uh, they don't expect us to go back to the 50s and 60s. They know that rail has been a disaster under the private sector and they would expect it to be a modern 21st century rail service, publicly owned. And that is precisely, as far as I'm concerned, what renationalising the NHS will be about and what the NHS reinstatement bill that I mentioned earlier is about. So I agree with you that we don't want to go back to the 50s and 60s, but I disagree with you that renationalisation, the word, has to give that impression. I want 21st century renationalisation. And just as everybody is clear that the Corbyn led party uh, is taking us towards. 21st century public services as if people and technology uh, mattered. That is exactly, in my view, what needs to happen with the NHS. But I take your cautionary note about the semantics of the word renationalisation. Um, but maybe if you have a better word which means exactly the same, but lacks the lacks what in your head is something to do with the 1950s. It would be great to hear it. Well, it's not it's, it's not so much in the terms of the, in terms of the, the words or whatever, but but it is about um, if you look across even across Europe, it's not the case that we have large general hospitals necessarily as, as the as the as the as, as the first point of entry to a, to a, a modern advanced health system. So for me, it's it's making sure that, and, and I suppose. I, I would hope that our Labour Party and the trade unions and the uh, pro NHS groups would maybe say that what we need is something the Commission to think about what our health health system 
and healthcare system would look like because there has been all these huge advances around genetics and informatics, which means that healthcare of a high standard and a good quality, which is free at the point of use and is completely nationalised, can be delivered in a lot of different ways. But I don't think we've thought through those that, that part of it. And I suppose that was the point that I would, that I would make. I think you know, we'll, that, that's what I mean by more and better. Well, the Socialist Health Association, which I chair, has certainly thought it through. And we published a green paper, a consultative document, at the Brighton Labour Party conference, setting out our views on just what you've described, a fully public uh, NHS and fully public social care service set in the context of 21st century uh, values and resources and materials and I hope very much that that is the vision that Labour will take forward so points well taken thank you. Uh, Alex thanks for an uh, excellent talk and a really always concerning uh, keep hearing these talks every so often every six months and the situation is getting worse and worse. I want to ask you a very difficult question and I think if you had the answer you would have already said it but um, the story from Stockport is standing on the streets with the, the protest outside Stepping Hill Hospital, every other car that goes past beeps that support. Our most implacable enemy is the local Labour councillors in many ways, and my latest intelligences are that they've just denounced the Stockport NHS watch. How do we put pressure on those councillors that are, that, are, that are not in line with our, process, with our vision of this renationalisation of the NHS? Yeah, thank you. It is difficult and um, I call myself and the Socialist Health Association, as long as I chair it, as critical friends to the Labour Party. And that's what I'm trying to do by publishing these radical blogs uh, in like the two that I uh, put up, for example. Um, I want to gently coax, um, I, I won't use that repulsive word nudge because um, uh, that's, uh, that's the repository of economists and um, I, I don't think economists uh, always understand what goes on in, in the real world. Um, I, I want to gently persuade uh, the, the Labour Party to take us in that direction and I want to see pressure exerted on the leadership, the leader's office and the shadow health team to take us at a greater rate in the direction you're describing. I want local authorities to be drawn together by John Ashworth and his team and to be reminded of the composite, composite 8 motion that was passed at conference and the fact that, that, that Labour Party policy, because conference is sovereign, now calls for complete, sorry, renationalisation of the NHS and that Stockport and the rest of Greater Manchester and Liverpool and every Labour council in the land needs to be considering what they can do to help ensure that the STPs and accountable care systems are stopped here and now. And every local authority has a role because it provides social care and, has, and therefore must collaborate in the interests of patients and clients with the NHS. But they must do it in a way that refuses to allow Simon Stevens and his neoliberal privateers to take forward the STPs. So um, we need more action than we've currently got from Labour Central and I am calling for that now. And I hope that you in Stockport will continue to call for it and certainly the SHA will support you in that. Um, <coughs> um, with the de-skilling and the devaluing of... Work, Where are you? Um, you say you're, you're in the right direction. Um, de-skilling and devaluing of the labour market within 
uh, the NHS and the private healthcare, the advice and everything like that. Uh, how would Labour, if say they won a general election next, go about um, increasing the skill load and making sure that you can have got that utopian NHS that we all want um, and making sure that it's safe and it's carried out in the right manner. So how long would it take for that to kind of be implemented and how will they would kind of increase that skill load and get to the service and efficiency that we want to? Yeah, um, if I knew the exact answer to that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in <laughs> Westminster um, planning the next manifesto. Um, or, or possibly even sitting in Jeremy's office with a, a little beard. Um, uh, these aren't easy questions to answer. And while I'm very clear on the political direction that's required, there's a lot of questions that have to be answered before, before one can say what needs to be said with regard to this. One, for example, is the true cost of a fully public NHS and as we speak people are working um, in one of the uh, anti-market think tanks to try and work out the cost of a fully public NHS as if people mattered um, rather than the horrible NHS we have at the moment where as I said vast sums of taxpayers money are hemorrhaging into the wallets of the Bransons and the shareholders of uh, the other companies that I've mentioned. So obviously a fully public NHS in principle would be cheaper because we wouldn't have the so-called transaction costs of either a commercial market or an internal market. So we need to know precisely what the savings would be and how much those savings would leave us short of what we would need given the uh, increasing cost of technology etc and I would certainly like to see much greater controls on the cost of NHS drugs you know big pharma for too long have been befriended by governments of all colors and while good things go on in the pharmaceutical sector um, a lot more uh, drugs than at present should be uh, well provided cheaply and generically and I would like to see a Labour government paying attention to that so so in terms of the economics there's a lot of a lot more work that needs to be done so we're not going to get what you call the utopian NHS overnight but I want obviously to push us in that direction as rapidly as possible um, you know, in terms of the S Wave your hand. S <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> Hi. Do you know, in terms of the STDs and getting councils not to work with them, um, are councils and sort of councillors aware that, like, um, obviously when you see, like, the documents that come out of them, I think they say, like, that, you know, so say, like, the, the mayor's not Mayside, Mayside and Cheshire one, it'll say such and such a person at like, um, you know, all the high hospital or local hospital is, is um, responsible for this document, but I think quite often they're written by like PricewaterhouseCoopers or, um, you know, what one of the big sort of accounting firms, a council is sort of aware of that and if not, can we make them aware of that and would that sort of make them less likely to maybe want to sort of work with it? Um, I totally share your view regarding that issue. I worked as a public health consultant in the NHS before they used these consultancies in the late 1970s and it sickened me and continues to do so once massive sums of NHS money started, once again I'll use that word, hemorrhaging into the pockets of these companies that basically do nothing that couldn't be done in-house. They come along, talk to people and then feed back to them what they've told them and what usually they've been told in advance by management they want to hear. And the amount that goes to these companies, particularly 
the ones you, you've mentioned, uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers. I've mentioned KPMG. Um, above all, uh, McKinsey, who have been taking taxpayers' money in the UK for and around the world for decades. And McKinsey are very much involved with the Davos uh, papers that lead, led to the five-year forward view. So they have been actively undermining the NHS it, under governments of all colours, I'm very sad to say. Accountable care organisations go back to the 2009 Brown government and McKinsey work that McKinsey did for the Department of Health at that time, although they only really got off in a big way under the Tory government. So I totally agree with you. Ludicrous sums of money in, uh, are going in the hundreds of millions or even billions are going to those at a time of horrendous constraints on public expenditure. And it is just totally sickening while the, the, Theresa May and her colleagues are on the one hand starving public sector services and public sector workers with, with the public sector pay cap and so on, while giving horrendous sums of money to these private companies that charge exuberantly inflated uh, sums for their, uh, their so-called expertise. I don't know precisely how much councils are aware of them. Councils are being cut back so much at the moment that I hope they've got the sense not to be spending money on these consultancies. But certainly I know that the NHS is still using them in a big way. And like you, I fervently hope it will stop sooner rather than later. Uh, high arcs uh, still at the back, which do not best hear to stop they don't look down these stairs. So we're still at the back. Wave your hand. Yes. Yeah. Up the back. To your right. Up the seat. To your right. A little bit more. You got me. Thanks, Alice. Um, th thanks for your talk, which was uh, slightly depressing in places, but also Sorry. helpful. Uh, and it is nice to hear someone champion the cause of, of the NHS in, in such a positive way. Um, just sort of reflecting on some of your comments about, I, I forget the phrase you used, whether it was intentional chaos or deliberate chaos. Um, and I think anyone who's had any dealings with the NHS in recent years will have their own stories of delayed operations, information going missing, um, well, just general chaos and sort of sense of ineptitude and that everything is just in a complete and utter mess. Anything from trivial masses for patients contracting diseases, even patients dying through you know, malpractice and, and so on. Um, and I think really sometimes people kind of lose the fact that this is deliberate, there is a real strategy in place here. I think one of them has to look at other aspects of the public sector that are being run by a Tory government. Job seekers allowance, universal credit. So every single aspect of, of, of public sector is being run into the ground through this kind of deliberate, this, this chaos. And, and what it does, it, it grinds patients down, it grinds benefit claimants down, it grinds staff down. And we end up with a sort of general sense of apathy that this is how it is. This narrative of public sector inefficiency and ineptitude just seems to grab hold and, and, and takes root and, 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 and grows and develops and, and people get very sort of cynical and apathetic. Um, I mean, Conservatives at the moment are in an absolute mess. Lots of two ministers within the last couple of weeks don't seem to know where they're going over Brexit. And yet, if you look at the polls, I think Labour is about two percentage points ahead in the polls, we should be racing ahead at, at the moment. And I, and I just wonder sometimes that we're, we're Labour or, or, or various organisations supporting the public sector are, are, are not getting these messages across loudly and clearly enough that this is a deliberate policy of mismanagement designed to prime the public sector for privatisation. And I just wonder what you think, you know, Jeremy Corbyn and Labour and you know, your organisation, you know, you know, socialist health, national health, and so on. What, what, we, what we can and should be doing more effectively to get this message across that this isn't just down to poor staffing or apathetic staffing or lack of resources. 
it's a deliberate policy. I think just wonder what you can do to raise that a little bit more. Okay. Yes, yes, you've raised a lot of issues there. And I'm going to start with perhaps a slightly unexpected one. Um, there was a brilliant paper produced uh, about three years ago by the New Economics Foundation. It's still available on the um, internet by Anna Coot and colleagues. And it was about social solidarity and the importance of reviving the idea of solidarity as as a value, I'll say it, as an English value. And I say that deliberately because Scots and Welsh and Irish understand solidarity much be better than the English. Um, that's why it's in England that we have these particular problems with the NHS. We have had the best part of 40 years of neoliberal government now, continuously, since 1979, governments of all colours, they've all been neoliberal. And basically, most people in this room were probably born since 1979, so you've never known anything, or grown up since then, so you've never known anything but neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is about individualism and solipsism and sometimes, sadly, about greed. Um, whereas social solidarity is about the opposite of Margaret, what Margaret Thatcher said. There is such a thing as society, but we've all been socialised into thinking that, as Thatcher said, there is no such thing as society. There are just individuals and families looking out for themselves. And solidarity is so important. And I think through his actions, Jeremy Corbyn and his Socialist Labour Party have, and particularly the last election manifesto, have shown how important social solidarity is, that we should think about each other and start caring for each other and not just focusing on ourselves and our own needs and our family's needs. But there's, that is a big uphill struggle. And like what that New Economics Foundation uh, uh, document said, we need to think about ways in firstly reintroducing the S word, Solidarność, as they used to say in Poland uh, in an earlier um, uh, period, um, and, and getting that percolating through our society. Another thing I think we need to think about is the amount of violence that has been caused through public policy. And you described it very clearly. And the thing that got me thinking about this is because you talked about universal credit. And my friend and former colleague, Debbie Abrahams, has done so much in the shadow work and pensions role to expose, for example, uh, just as uh, Ken Loach did in I, Daniel Blake, the avoidable deaths, let alone the massive suffering that has been caused by the policies explicitly of David Cameron, Theresa May, Ian Duncan Smith. These people specifically pushed policies that they knew were causing suffering and in many cases, sadly, suicide. And in the peace studies movement uh, or area, um, uh, there is a concept called structural violence, which means suffering caused by public policy. But there was a much stronger phrase used actually in the 19th century for this phenomenon, which was social murder, in effect, causing death through public policy. And today, this morning, I circulated a press release about a new study, which I mentioned earlier, uh, from Cambridge, Oxford and UCL, which showed the hundreds of thousands of premature deaths that have been caused since uh, 2012, I think it is, uh, by 2010, sorry, by the austerity agenda. And one of the authors of that research um, used the phrase economic murder. And I think that kind of language needs to be used. 
We're very English, we're very restrained, aren't we? We need to be more forthright in our language. Like that researcher, I accuse the current government of economic murder and of social murder. And more of us need to use that kind of powerful language to make the point of what is being done to us by these politicians and raising awareness among the people uh, of England and of the UK that we need to turn the tide and re-elect governments that will prevent that, that ha from happening. Thank you. and social care as a good thing um, when it started. But there were two problems attached to that. And uh, one was the fact that social care is means tested. And the other is that social care was drastically underfunded. Um, and it's been, it's been part and parcel of what you've been talking about uh, tonight. But my biggest problem is local politicians um, because they're, they're, they're the, the, the next stage of the people that they're representing. They know what's happening. In Liverpool, uh, a couple of years back, Ros Gladden, who was head of adult social care, said that we, we, have, we, have cut, we have cut all we can. We are now cutting into the bone. And they proceeded to cut. Um, and that's what they did. They didn't make a stand. They didn't talk about the needs of the community. Because I have no faith in the Maliks. I have faith in the saving the NHS. I say so the pincer movement between uh, national, uh, our, our national leaders now in the Labour Party and the Labour Party membership that we will, we will drive local politicians into doing something. Thank you. Yeah, um, I don't think it's just a matter of faith. So I don't really think about politics in terms of faith. Um, politics is about the wielding of power and authority. And it's also about, about the public speaking out, albeit often we only get the opportunity to speak out uh, through elections. And when we, cho when we choose to go out on the streets and take uh, either uh, through demonstrations or take direct action. And I prefer to think of politics in those terms rather than um, uh, whether or not I have faith. I, I think I would say in a sense that maybe unlike you, uh, I have faith in the notion of democratic governance. I still believe in that system. And I think we need to think about how we can start making that system work for us. And uh, the, the context of integration, which you raise, is obviously a very important one. And it has to be said that integration under the present government um, is a weasel word, which isn't what integration would mean under a future label, Labour government. Of course, we want seamless integrated services. Of course, uh, to paraphrase you, we want health, not just health care free at the point of use, we want social care, all social care free at the point of use. And um, we're not going to get that under the present government and anything that calls itself integration under the present government isn't really that at all. Um, and as you say, uh, anything that in the present climate involves the integration of health and social care is just as likely to mean health moving towards means testing as it is to mean social care moving towards, uh, you know, becoming cost free. Thank you very much, Alex. I'm afraid our time is up, uh, but I'd certainly like to thank you for your lecture, your questions and answers. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. And also to 
ask you to do your bit uh, in terms of do what you can to put pressure on your local representatives, on your member of parliament, to do something to save the NHS. Because uh, after seven years of pretty flat funding, uh, the NHS is a very resilient organisation, but it faces pressures the like of which we probably haven't seen in a generation this winter. Uh, so please, leave here and go out and fight for the NHS. Thank you.